Hi, good morning to the US, good evening to Europe, and uh, thank you for joining this second keynote on day two of Link Forward. My name is Konstantin, and I have the honor to moderate this panel on the current state and the future of real-time data infrastructure. For those of you who are joining just now, we've just heard Chen's keynote on how Pinterest has moved from Kafka streams to Flink, their lessons learned on the way. Thanks again, thanks again Chen, for, for sharing these insights with the community, highly appreciated. Now to the panel. As, uh, as said, we'd like to discuss where real-time uh, Real-time data processing stands today. Uh, we'll talk about adoption barriers and challenges and uh, what the future might look like in this space. It says that uh, a panel is only as good as its panelists. So this one has the potential to be great uh, because we have five amazing panelists. First, we have uh, Vasia Kalavri, who is an assistant professor at Boston University. Her research focuses on distributed stream processing and large-scale graph analytics. She's a very early contributor to Apache Flink, even before it was called Apache Flink, and co-author of uh, Stream Processing with Apache Flink, the, I would say, standard textbook on Apache Flink. Next comes Kim Hines. Um, since quite recently, she's a distinguished engineer and data processing area architect at Splunk. Uh, even more impressive, she has spent eight years at Google, where she was a core contributor um, to and eventually led and managed Google Flume and the shared stack used by Flume and uh, Dataflow. Then we have Eric, um, Eric Summer, um, who is CEO at Decodable, uh, a young company whose uh, mission it is, and I, I hope I pitch this correctly, uh, to make stream processing and real-time data pipelines as, as easy and approachable as batch processing is uh, today. He previously worked at Caldera and uh, then sold the company to Splunk, where he uh, stayed for a few years as part of its senior product leadership team. Then we have Annie Katmukashi, uh, who is an engineering manager on the stream processing team at Facebook. Prior to that, he worked on uh, data platform teams at YouTube, at Twitter, at Netflix. Um, and Annie Kat is also no stranger to the Apache Software Foundation. He is a PMC member of both Apache Sake and Apache Pig. And last but not least, um, there's Stefan Evan. Uh, he's our CTO and co-founder at Favorica and uh, PMC chair of Apache Flink. So welcome everyone to the stage. Um, thank you for joining uh, this panel. Really uh, looking forward to, to the discussions. Before we begin, uh, a quick reminder for the audience. Uh, you can ask questions via the comments section on the right throughout the discussions. Um, I'll do my best to pick those up when it's a good time. And um, we probably also have some time at the end to address additional questions. So. As I mentioned, we'd like to start in the here and, and now and, and talk about uh, areas where, where stream processing and, and real-time data processing is or generally plays, plays a dominant role already. Um, so maybe Aniket, um, from, from your experience at Facebook, or, um, at Facebook, in which areas do you see this transition from, from offline to real-time data processing? And maybe while you're at it, you can tell us also a little bit about um, the real-time stack at Facebook um, to give us some context. Yeah, sure. Yeah, happy happy to do the, do that. So uh, at Facebook, I mean, of course, we have a lot of like offline processing with uh, Spark and uh, and Presto in the mix, and uh, we also see a lot of uh, real-time kind of need to process data in real time. So both of like all of kind of our logging data that uh, goes to scribe which is a kind of our message bus system uh, uh, and then from that uh, we basically land our data to data warehouse and then also uh, kind of process it in real time for various real like monitoring uh, alerting use cases primarily uh, then also more more recently we are seeing a lot of kind of uh, use in machine learning so doing like real time feature extractions uh, Feature engineering, and uh, so that you go, that that could be used further into like predictive analytics and and stuff like that. So that's kind of the state of uh, kind of uh, real time processing at Facebook. Uh, primarily three use cases: uh, analytics, uh, like transformation, so enriching real time streams to add more kind of context to the data, and then lastly the real time and uh, a, a, a real time ML and AI use cases. Mm -hmm. That makes that makes sense. How, how does that com compare to, to your experience, Kim? Yeah, um, so I, I think my experience is very similar, right? So uh, things that I, I've seen 
uh, ML is very relevant for uh, for stream processing uh, as well as uh, enriching data and uh, doing analytics and transforms. I think a thing I, I can say is that uh, at Splunk we're using um, streaming analytics to do ingestion of data into uh, into logs, uh, you know, into internal storage for logs, so that um, we, we can do some stuff on it before people uh, actually do searches. Uh, at, at Google, um, it, it in some ways it was kind of the wild west of of um, you know, streaming use cases and, you know, taking it, maybe, maybe removing some of the assumptions around real time about it being, um, meaning that it has really low latencies. I think there's actually a lot of things that are considered batch use cases today that would fit that definition if we're talking about real time as including latencies that might be on the order of a day rather than sub minute latencies. And um, yeah, I, I think this is an interesting area to explore. And I think there's trade-offs and freedoms in the uh, in the solution space if we're exploring that problem space that that really aren't part of the the current streaming landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that for sure. The I, I guess I guess um, Facebook, Google, Splunk is is like one world. <laughs> Um, is that um, like I, I think Eric and and Vazia, you you've worked with more let's say smaller, more traditional companies um, quite recently. Um, do you see a, a difference there in, in terms of how stream processing um, or real time processing in general is is adopted? Uh, Vazia, do you wanna do you wanna take that first? Sure, I can go ahead. So. Um, I guess I haven't worked with smaller companies, but I have an ongoing on collaboration with um, investigators in the medical campus of BU, so people who work with uh, mobile health data and want to analyze um, continuous streams from wearable devices, for example, smartwatches or glucose monitors or blood pressure monitors. And their use cases are... Um, simple in terms of you know the, the kinds of analytics that they want to to run on these streams and not and they don't have such low latency requirements so that goes to, to Kim's point um, that you know maybe once a day or once every a few hours uh, processing uh, and it's and we're not talking about huge amounts of data here so we're talking about you know a few participants and you know some uh, data points every minute or every hours. But then, you know, once once this is in place, they also want to expand into building real time, uh, sorry, into building um, machine learning models that could potentially be continuously, not real time. So I, I like the word continuously more for these kinds of use cases, right? It's a continuous stream. It doesn't have to be really high throughput. It doesn't have to, to have really low latency requirements, but we have a continuous stream of data that comes in, right? So this uh, um, this is what I've seen in my uh, experience here at BU. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, at the highest level, I think that there's probably two classes of, there's two reasons that, that people put this real-time infrastructure into place. One is they want sort of like the freshest view of data for analytics purposes, right? So like, you know, Kim talked about, you know, what I'll, I'll sort of, I guess, group as like observability style use cases where the faster you sort of detect that something's wrong with like a service or network, you know, sort of like that you can, at least in theory, sort of respond faster, whether that's an, in an automated fashion or like with a human staring at a dashboard or sort of getting a page or something like that. And that's sort of like intuitive, that makes sense. Um, and I think the analytics is worth sort of like as, as an aside thinking about like the analytics systems are actually moving more and more real time. So like you see like Apache Pino is sort of interesting. You see projects like Druid, you see projects like, uh, or even companies like Rockset and Materialize and sort of like all these other kinds of systems that are sort of moving more and more toward, you know, real time analytics. But, you know, so one, one sort of universe of streaming use cases, you know, that I've seen people in sort of the traditional enterprise is just like, let's just pump data into analytic systems so that like we can like humans can sort of make decisions like with, with some degree of, of, um, 
uh, freshness of data. And to Vazia's point, like it's not like Bloomberg terminal day trading. It's not like people like staring at screens and like hitting buy and sell as fast as possible. It's really, you know, a continuous sort of like update of, of data there. But the, and, and I think Chen talked about this with Pinterest is that amortizing the the cost of processing large volumes of data is incredibly helpful, especially when you have spiky workloads. You know, so like if you have a retailer that does like some big sort of blitz or something like that with with sales, being able to process that data continuously so you sort of smooth out those big humps rather than get like one batch that is like a saw like a square wave in terms of like you know volume of data. But the other case that I think is even more interesting, and I think a bigger driver, honestly, of real time is data powered microservices. So like increasingly you see people building, and I, I think uh, Anikit and Kim and, and Vazia all sort of talked about this, but like these services that hang off of Kafka topics or Kinesis or SQS or GCP PubSub that are either doing like real-time scoring or evaluation with the model or enrichment of data to make sense to downstream systems or feature aggregation and extraction or NLP processing. There's like all of these kinds of use cases I had one social media company tell me that with every order of decrease of of latency so that they can make product or uh, content recommendations in the social stream before someone switches apps there's like a requisite increase in in monetary value for the company and like you know we can all sort of like complain about selling ads to people and I'm I'm with you on that but the idea that um increasing engagement you know, intra-session rather than intercession is sort of an interesting idea about sort of product recommendations and, you know, all of these other kinds of features, including things like shutting down misbehaving or suspicious account logins and like all these other kinds of things. So those are all like very much real-time oriented or or continuous low latency kinds of use cases. So I think you see that industry across uh, finance and retail and, inventory management and observability and you know all of these other kinds of use cases that I think are really interesting. Sorry, that's a long answer. <laughs> a good one too. Um, Stefan, uh, do you want to, to add anything from, from like your view on the Flink community? Yeah, yeah. Um, as, as much as I hate to say it because it makes this a very non-controversial panel, um, I pretty much have to agree with everything everybody said so far. <laughs> Um, but I, I'd like to specifically maybe follow up on the last point that that, that Eric meant with the two two categories because I, I think that's that's a really interesting um, way of putting it and I think it's also one where I, I think I see a little bit of a divide between the types of users for the system. So we we definitely see both of them in the in the Flink community. The folks that that go the go the route of let, let's use stream processing to pump data faster into into some analytical system and the folks that say it's let's use this to power like real-time data-driven microservices so the the last one yeah as an example i think the one that we've seen quite a bit being um being being used in the context of link is, is real-time fe feature um extraction um assembly engineering and so on to power um, yeah, to power classifiers and recommenders and so on, for example, or to power to bid bidding models, pricing models, and so on. But that kind of like these real-time data-driven microservices, I have a feeling is something that's at the moment something that the big tech savvy companies do a lot. And I, I, I have a feeling this is something that if like if we're talking to the more traditional enterprises, there's still a lot more on the side of, yeah, we use stream processing to pump things faster into our data warehouse or data lake and and then yeah, and be able to then generate report reports on, on, on fresher data. So while yeah, I, I think there's like there are different, very different stages in the adoption cycle right now, those two different use cases. I you know, if I if I can just sort of add to that, like, you know, as a as a vendor, as an evil vendor. You know, if we try and pitch a customer on, but don't you want your analytics data fresher or faster? People kind of shrug. I'll be honest with you. People kind of shrug and they kind of go like, batch is good enough. 
you know, like we, we actually don't care, you know, because the batches are sort of like, as you can do sort of more in parallel, the sort of um, iteration time, I think it's gets low enough where you get into like the 10 minute window and like Apache Airflow plus DBT plus Snowflake or something like that. Like people just kind of go like, you know, that's, it's good enough. And I think what's funny, or at least what I've seen, maybe may slightly controversial, is that the programming model is changing. The programming model, I think, for a lot of these services is moving toward a bunch of loosely coupled services that are separated by either RPC or messaging systems. And the fact that like the whole universe is like a distributed system at this point, there's like no more monoliths has actually meant that the stream became the source of truth rather than the data in like an operational database or something like that. The operational database sort of like hangs off of the back end of the microservice rather than being sort of like the sources. And so I think that like there's this interesting transition happening where by more and more services moving sort of like natively online and becoming these real-time processes, the stream becomes the source of truth. And then it becomes obvious to pump data into analytic systems via these real-time streams. And I'll tell you, at least from, from the sort of sandbox I play in, people don't think about building those real-time services as stream processing. There's actually a language divide. They talk about it like event-driven architectures. They talk about it like all of these other words. But when you ask them what they're doing, they're like, well, we filter some stuff and we mask some PII data and like, you know, like all these other kinds of like boring sort of like stream processing type things where they enrich that data. And you're like, you realize that's a join, right? And they're like, no, no, no. It's like a lookup. You're like, no, no, no. Like you're doing joins. Like, you know, and like you start to explain it and like you realize that like everyone's building bespoke real-time processing, stream processing systems into those microservices. And so part of this, I wonder, is just like a language thing and like uh, an architectural sort of blueprint thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll sort of shut up. But like, I think there's something interesting there. No, I'll quickly add to that that this is also true at big tech companies. It's not like you know big tech companies don't suffer from this problem because tendency in in the engineering world is you know first like think of something from first principles and like build these microservices and kind of uh, solve the problem and then later on think about the frameworks that can help them s simplify it by some operational support and things like those. And we we are like one of the challenges we face also is like changing that that conversation like can you think of using stream processing frameworks as a as as as, as a first place to start building these applications and if you hit problems and come to the infra teams talk about your requirements and 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 help us you know build those features for you so that's something we also do see at big tech so it's not it's a i think a more widespread problem i, th I think that that's actually a, a good point uh, some something um that that we can talk about more because the like on the one hand we we see this adoption of um, stream processing um, and and we see it's a it's a hot topic if you will <laughs> um, but on there's the other truth is it's still difficult for many and and quite quite painful at times maybe um, and the question is why why is this I think Eric you already alluded to that a bit but I um I think we can can talk a little bit more about that yeah. Maybe one follow-up follow to, to what Eric said. Um, like the the companies that are more and more realizing, yeah, the data should just like land as a stream, and then it comes a lot more natural to, to treat it as a stream. I'm, I'm I'm wondering. Also, I think Annick had said it. Like the the big companies like to think rethink the things from first principles, but then like I got the feeling that that's actually one of the exact problems that that, that the the adoption of this event driven microservices also has. If you go a little bit beyond the like more bleeding edge companies, because they don't quite have the luxury to rethink things from first principles. They actually very much. Can can you explain what, what first principles are for? Yeah, I mean, just to just think. Okay, if we if we would, you know, if we had no constraints um, from from existing you know infrastructure, like how would we build this? And then very often you you arrive at yeah, like a really cool event driven architecture is the way to go here. But then very often companies aren't in that position, right? They don't have the luxury of a big team that can rebuild it from first principles. They might actually be tied for regulatory reasons even 
um, around certain types of architectures. And it, it, it just turns out they, they're still starting with a big database in the middle and so on. And they kind of have to bridge into this other world. And it, that, that doesn't, isn't easy. I have the feeling a lot of times this fitting the streaming model into existing architectures is actually one of the biggest barriers people had. Like even if they subscribe to, to, the, to the idea of this, like making it work in the company isn't easy. Yeah, that's where you see um, like this sort of dreaded discussion about change data capture. You know, people people get into discussions about sort of bridging the streaming sort of way or CQRS and like all of these other kinds of streaming patterns, um, bridging that to sort of more traditional architectures, like, you know, two tier, three tier application architectures where, you know, you're doing change data capture out of like a MySQL or Postgres instance or something like that and creating a stream of changes that you sort of operate on. Um, but, you know, at least in the larger companies, you know, and thinking about sort of like the global 2000 kinds of organizations that are much more traditional finance, insurance, oil and gas, energy sort of related, you know, uh, kinds of companies, you know, these things happen over a long period of time and they happen incrementally. There are very few sort of rip and replace. I mean, some companies are sort of brave, but, you know, they, they happen through a series of small changes. I think what we've, at least what I've seen is that it happens in these larger organizations on a team by team basis. So like with each sort of new service, it, it, they sort of like incrementally roll into sort of a different kind of architecture. And the thing that we've seen is that, you know, I mean, I think Kafka's popularity as becoming sort of like this agnostic transport between different worlds, you know, it sort of works as like a, a universal channel to move between a streaming world and, you know, and a, a batch world, if you will, or sort of like a more traditional world. Uh, I think that the complexity comes into maintaining semantics. I mean, you know, Constantine, to your question about sort of like, you know, how, where does the complexity come from? The semantics around, God help me, time, messaging guarantees, ordering guarantees, like, you know, the, the world starts flipping inside out for a lot of people. And um, I don't think we as like a streaming community have found our equivalent of like the REST interface. You know, like if you, if you wanted to like create sort of like the, the quote unquote API to something like this, you know, is it really thinking about the world as like a discretized, you know, stream of events? Like, is that, or is that too low level? Like, should we actually be more prescriptive, you know, at least at some layer of the stack, right? The lowest level layers, you know, just like the internals of Flink, you know, at the lowest level layer, it's the most flexible and it sort of exposes you to the universe. And then like, as you kind of go up the stack, you you're more and more prescriptive there. I think things like stateful functions and lambdas and like all these other kinds of, you know, ways might be sort of more natural to most application developers, you know, to, to get them on board and to get them thinking about, you know, these, these boundaries. I mean, we need to speak the language of our developer community, not, and I say this with all the love in the world to this group, but like not to the academic community, you know, the academics sort of know how this stuff works. You know, the question is how do you make, you know, your, your sort of, um, your average engineer deeply productive, you know, versus like a, an expert in stream processing. So, I, um, yes, I, if I could add to this point, I guess uh, I agree uh, that there are, you know, there's a lot of complexity. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of uh, confusion also in the terms that we are using now in this panel, right? So we've talked about stream processing and it, it, it seems like each of us has a different definition of what stream processing encompasses, right? So for, for example, in my mind, event-driven and data flow are two distinct things. Uh, of course, we know that you know stateful functions work on top of Flink, but the distinction is one of scheduling. Like, do I need something that is like up and running all the time, or do I need something that you know gets triggered and wakes up when I have an event? And I guess the second model is uh, maybe more intuitive to people um, and fits 
a larger um, uh, set of use cases. And it's also kind of simpler because you don't have to go into all the complexities of watermarks and event time and you know ordering guarantees. You receive an event, yeah, and then you do something, right? When you receive it. Um, so in terms of you know making the engineer productive, I think one place to start, at least uh, where I'm coming from <laughs> would be you know teaching people how to use stream processing uh, right um, and by that I mean um, you know teaching them even the concept of, of a stream is not taught at universities and colleges right now right uh, we teach people databases we teach people how to to build applications with uh, SQL and web interfaces but teaching stream processing is not part of of our curriculum. So it may be an advanced course, maybe a seminar course uh, where people learn about uh, stream processing. Um, so I, this is where I would start. <laughs> so what, one thing I, I just thought when, when Vasya was talking also about the lambdas and stateful functions and one has something running, one does not have something like running there. And in, in a lot of ways, I, th I think in the stream processing world, there's still a lot of blending of, let's say, the the logical concepts, how you how you model things, and then also like the, the physical concepts, how do they actually get uh, deployed and executed, and, and and this and that. And just curious, I think the database world has done this better in some regard, right? If you write a SQL query, like it's not the first thing that you that you think about. Oh, this is going to go to a column store or a row store or, um, or or something like that. And and for some reason, like this logical and physical things in the stream processing world, they still kind of blend a lot into each other. And and this also this is maybe a question for 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 Kim Beck. Um, you mentioned in the beginning there's there's a lot of like things where you look at it and it's it's actually lots of batch processing things that could be stream processing really from what they do but for some reason nobody ever thought about modeling them as, as, as stream processing and maybe still using a bursty execution strategy you know that that wakes up every 20 minutes like pulls pulls through like a lot then then maybe shuts it down just for resource efficiency but it's still like at least you get the semantics of a continuous continuous stream of data like why why is that not happening i'm, I'm really curious like this everything is a stream is in theory such a beautiful philosophy but it seems like it seems like it's not being adopted as much as it could be yeah um and i, I wouldn't say that people haven't thought about these as streams right they uh they do have their uh, their periodic batch um, they might think very much about what's happening across this per these periodic batches as a stream. They might even be thinking of things like sliding windows. Their sliding window might be an entire year, for example, like um, at a, a well-known application at a big tech company commonly uses a, uh, a sliding window of a year to make recommendations, right, with weighted averages across, across the window. Um, and the execution strategy for this is to run batches where they look at the entire set of data for the entire year previous to the day that they're, they're doing the batch, right? And they, they have this scheduled basically as a cron job, right? Every day, do this analysis, reanalyzing mostly the same data every day. And they've looked at using uh, the streaming stack and found that it's actually more efficient to redo the analysis for the entire year than uh, every day than to have an ongoing stream. And I think this goes to, um, you know, it's actually a third point in, uh, say, the streaming space, right? So there's the event triggered, right, where something happens when something else happens. Uh, there's the continuous, you know, we're always on. But there's also um, the time triggered period. And some of the advantages of this, right? It, it does have a lot of efficiencies when it's run. Um, the periodicity also has, uh, like if you're doing large scale resource allocation for a large company, you, know, you can actually look across all the periods of all the jobs that are running and figure out what kind of priority to give them um, and what kind of resources to allocate for them in advance, right? So this is kind of a, a meta thing. But the thing that's often missing is how critical is it for this to run on time? 
right? So I might be running something uh, every two hours, right? But it's okay for it to slide maybe uh, uh, 45 minutes or something else that's running every two hours. Maybe it can only slide five minutes. And this is a thing I think is missing is we, we're not capturing how much tolerance for slide there is. Um, I think also we're not, um, it, it would be very natural to look at this as a streaming problem with a, uh, with a, with a large sliding window that has an execution strategy of running in batches based on some period with certain guarantees. Um, and I, I won't say that people aren't looking at this, but it's a really hard problem to solve it. And I think um, there are resources being invested in how do we solve this? And this includes things like, you know, how do we, like if we have bat shuffles, how do we rejoin existing bat shuffles and, you know, maybe add to it, maybe subtract from it, right? So a sliding window, we might need to subtract if we're only concerned about the current window, right? Um, we might need to subtract from the shuffle in order to, um, how do we do things like that, right? And it, it gets kind of interesting, like what kind of state do we have to maintain to remove counts from a group by key, right? Um, just as kind of a simple example. So um, I, I think this, this more kind of captures the complexity of the problem space than simplifies the solution space as, uh, as Eric was alluding to. But, um, you know, one thing I've seen on the solution space, you know, just from the user perspective, they, they don't want to have to worry, you know, even PhDs, even streaming experts don't want to have to worry about all the low level details of how things work. They don't want to have to worry about how do we scale things? How do we, um, you know, there's, there's teams that start with the relational language because it's the most natural way to think about the problem. And then they rewrite it into kind of a data flow based language to, um, to actually have it be reliable, operating as a stream, meeting whatever guarantees they need to. Um, and I, I think a way to bridge that gap is to let them stay in a relational model all the way down, right? So basically they're, they're expressing at some level, um, this data set I want to have, this continuous uh, unbounded data set I want to have is actually some function of all these other data sets that are also unbounded that I have. And I have some latency requirements on how fresh it is compared to them. But I, I just want to ex uh, express how it's derived from them without having to worry about all the mechanics of what makes that happen. Right? And uh, I, I think that that's a, an interesting area to explore in the problem space, but it also means solving all the in-between problems. Like, how do we not make them worry about how to scale, right? Um, and I can tell you big companies have invested many, many years into solving that problem. And I, I would say it's not really solved well yet, right? Um, and, uh, how, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of work on how do we translate relational models into uh, into data flow models. You know, I, I know like data flow itself, you know, Google data flow has, uh, you know, it has adopted Calcite SQL as a SQL parser and has had a, a, a good amount of success with, with uh, you know, starting from SQL. I, I think Flink also has, uh, can do SQL and, uh, you know, Spark can do SQL as well. So I think this part, this part of the problem is pretty straightforward and we know how to tackle it but I think hiding all the complexity of what's happening behind that. But when it, it's really things that a user should be able to express at a high level, should be able to express their intent at a high level without having to, uh, having to think about the mechanics of making that intent real. Um, I, I think that that's really an interesting problem space to, to explore. Are there, are there good examples? Um of uh, from from like systems that that you have worked on uh where where this recently um has worked like um a feature or an improvement where where we've um hidden some complexity well um yeah i, I think I, I think a few things right like um if you look at 
uh, and I'll use Google as an example. Um, if you look at Millwheel from a few years ago, it, and you look at how would you actually use Millwheel in practice, it's like you're in deep with the complexity of streaming. Um, so one abstraction on top of that is streaming flume, right? So streaming flume, you get to think more about the problem that you're trying to solve than the infrastructure. You still have to think um, about streaming concepts like Windows, which actually in Mobile, it didn't have Windows, right? You had to build Windows yourself using triggers, right? It was that primitive. But, um, but it, it's still not totally natural, right? It's not the relational model. It's more of a how do we make the data flow model as easy to use as possible? And I think Flink is very similar to, um, to data flow. I think it's kind of become the state of the art, making the data flow aspect as easy as possible. One thing that uh, data flow is also invested, you know, Google data flow is invested a lot in is auto scaling, right? And um, I, I think it's working pretty well now. Right, it's like you don't accumulate. If you start accumulating a backlog, uh, you know things scale up, so the backlog goes down, and you're still meeting your latency guarantees. Um, but I, I think it it's a lot harder than people think to do this, and um, and I I don't know if there's going to be a way to make this just work across all different platforms easily and and in a way that users don't have to get in and start kicking the wheels and you know pushing a little bit to make it do what they want. Um, and of course, Google has the advantage of having a homogenous infrastructure internally. So this really simplifies a lot of these kind of problems also. Um, yeah, so their successes, they're, they're limited and they're in very narrow, <laughs> uh, very narrow operational Scopes. Does anyone else have a, a, a word of hope? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that like the, the I, th I think yeah, yeah, it both both yes and 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 maybe and maybe yes, but with a bit of time. I think there's I think the whole streaming SQL movements really a very very strong thing right now. Um, in, in in helping to solve solve a bunch of this, like Eric mentioned, also the, the like CDC before in, in helping to connect it um, with existing with existing infrastructure. I think these two things in combination: change data capture, dynamic tables, materialized use. I think they're they're very they're very promising concepts that actually help help with the adoption. Um, I think on the operational aspect, there's maybe if I can add this uh, to to what Kim said, I can I can just say this very much from the Flank perspective, right? Um, We've we've tried to build a unified system in Flink that um, that navigates between the streaming and the batch world, and um, and it actually turns out you you spend a lot of time optimizing the one side of the spectrum, the like low latency scalable network stack and state and checkpointing and everything, um, and you actually spend a lot of time optimizing the other end of the spectrum, like extremely scalable like self tuning batch shuffles and so on that go to whatever like tens of thousands of cores and still you know, don't don't overwhelm the disks and still work with net up, net network issues. And in some sense, you actually have to solve the whole spectrum in between as well, right? Because if you actually then go to the near real time thing, um, where you say, okay, I'm actually good with a few minutes of latency, and I want to actually get like to get the benefit of this re relaxed latency constraint, then you're then you have to do a little bit of like some some of the real time ish work, but also some of the you know batch scalable work at least if you go to the scale and so on and. It's yet another. It's not yet another point in the in, in the spectrum where you can't really use exactly the same thing you use on the one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum. And I think this is this is actually where 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 we can see see a lot of the things um, be, being the case. Like if you go purely batch, things work purely fairly well. If you go to to pure streaming and you're you know you're you're doing your cost trade off in such a way that yeah, like it's 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 accurate for real time. It's good if you're actually trying to do the the near real time thing, you're probably paying more resources than you need to because the system works in order, like works as if it should give you like the really more hard real time event by event, low latency results and so on. And then um, this also is like operationally a bit different, right? Because then you're actually more close to operating uh, like a real time microservice um, database and so on, which is maybe not what people expect when they're saying, I want to run a data pipeline that is really in, in a, with a few minutes of, 
uh, of, of lag time. That's how I think about it. And yeah, so. I, I was just thinking about, I mean, like you talk about sort of the programming model around this. I mean, one way to think about it is, is strictly within the a stream processing job or, or, or process. But the other sort of element to this is like, how does that pipeline fit into the larger sort of application that somebody is developing? And I think part of the impedance mismatch comes from this place of, you know, like when people, to Kim's point and, and you know, in your point to think about like thinking in a relational sort of term or a series of, you know, functions applied to, you know, to a relation, um, you know, I also think that like, it depends on the application touch point at the two ends of that stream. You know, if, you know, just sort of in practical terms, if someone is building um, an application using sort of Akka with like actors and stuff like that, their application fits really, really nicely with the notion of like real time events and, pro you know, you know, continuous processing and stuff like that versus like request response style sort of APIs and stuff like that. So I, I almost think that, you know, there's a bunch of work to do sort of like in the box, uh, like the stream processing box on the on the sort of, you know, on the theoretical architecture diagram. But like when you sort of move out one layer, you sort of have to think about how are the applications and processes, you know, to the left and the right of each one of those stream processing jobs, how are they functioning? And, you know, that's when you get into, I think, a lot of the stuff that, you know, that Kim is talking about. And, you know, I think, well, everybody here has sort of mentioned, you know, um, that's where the impedance mismatch and sort of the complexity, to me at least, really sort of comes into play. And so like modeling these things as relations and SQL and, and those kinds of things are ways of sort of bridging that divide. But I wonder if there are different programming models that, you know, at the application edge that interact better or worse. You know, I, I actually think that there's some some thinking to do there, some research to do there. Maybe, Eric, maybe I, one, I, one thing to, to quickly, yeah. Sorry. I, sorry, sorry to jump in there. We only have three minutes left, so I, I'd um, in in this panel, the uh, time actually flew by quite quite quickly. Um, so I, I'd like to do one one final kind of round um, um, to kind of close this panel as well. Um, if you if you look at at your your own work or the work of your your company, what um, what is the like the 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 one um, user problem that you that you want would like to solve in let's say or would like to have solved in in three years complexity complexity like all day complexity yeah and, and one of the other areas we are, we're trying to invest is uh, you know trying to bring all the uh, kind of database side of ideas uh, into streaming so trying to kind of uh, have as much consolidation with all the database side of worlds because that that's moving really fast and bringing like commonalities there would basically it it, it just basically simplifies the user experience. So talking about streaming SQL, having consistency with your experience with all the other query engines uh, is kind of important. Uh, like vectorization is some of the things gets talked about uh, for efficiency side of things in the database side of worlds, but we don't really apply those here. So trying to kind of figure out where, whether that applies uh, uh, to, to streaming side of things. Uh, those kind of things are also kind of uh, something uh, we want to kind of invest and see. You know, more from an infra point of view than, than expressibility and user point of view. So from my side, uh, I guess we're very much invested into making stream processing easier for non-expert users or domain experts, not so much in terms of programming because this is not my area of expertise. And I think the streaming SQL line of work is actually quite promising, but in terms of operations, and we mentioned a few problems there like auto scaling, for instance, it's just one instance of what we have to do. There are so many configuration options that people have to very, very carefully tune right now and they interact with each other in, in so many ways. So if we can, you know, get rid of all that complexity. Uh, I think that would be a, a great step forward. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would subscribe to that as well. The, uh, I would maybe phrase it a bit different in, in saying 
making making a stream processor feel less different than than other applications that that folks are used to right and i think i think i think sql is part of that you know makes it feel more similar to a database even though you know you're not talking about dynamic tables instead of maybe static table snapshots but then also um like why can't i deploy it in the same way and auto scale it in the same way like in, in another application just like it should as much as possible feel the same way this is a it's not an easy thing because stream processors aren't exactly like other applications you do have this dual nature of being both computeful and stateful but still like i think that that should be the direction and kim you have the last word okay uh i'll say um everything that everyone else said um and kind of more more to that point um yeah i, I think in the next three years, right, we can accomplish anything, right? That's an infinite amount of time in terms of tech. Um, <laughs> yeah, we should be looking at the end user from end to end, right? So I, I think streaming, yeah, and uh, Vasiliki's looking uh, at this, or um, the end user isn't necessarily even a developer at all, right? And to Eric's point, right, the end user may be the end user of a, a long pipeline that the the, uh, the streaming piece is only part of it, right? Um, I, I would like to see it so that that end user can just interact naturally and express their intent without having to worry about how any of it is implemented underneath, under the covers. And uh, that, that's my, my hope for three years. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone else. Um, only one minute over time. I think uh, that that is still acceptable. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks uh, the panelists. Thanks, for everyone, for joining. Um, we have the first round of breakout sessions now. They start in a few minutes. Enjoy the conference. Have a nice rest of the day. And um, happy streaming. <laughs> <laughs>